the former Licensing Online members from Australia and New Zealand. My name's Monica O'Brien and I'm joined today by Sinead Full from Willow Publishing, I'm sure some of you would know Sinead, and Brenna Cronin, the General Manager of One Licence. We're very excited about this new partnership with One Licence. I've personally had a long association with Ali Karras, who's the President of One Licence, and in these past few months, we've benefited very much from the excellent service that Brenna and her team in Chicago have provided for Sinead and I, as we, like you, would be on a reasonably steep learning curve. There's a genuine commitment by the people at One Licence to serve each and every person associated with One Licence, including the licence holders and, of course, composers of our sacred music. And so this will be a great opportunity for those of us who are new to One Licence to learn from Brenna, who's very familiar with the One Licence program and the webinar platform. So it's my pleasure to, to hand you over to Brenna, who will be able to tell us more about the process for today and lead us in this webinar. Wonderful. Thank you, Monica. Hello to you all. Uh, hello from Chicago. It's good evening over here and good morning to all of you. Thank you so much to those of you who were able to join us today. Um, this is the third type of uh, educational instructional webinar that we've had. Um, we had two of them back in January um, for folks who were joining us from licensing online in North America. We also had one for license holders who were already with one license. And now this is kind of the third sort of instructional one that we're doing. Um, so at this point, I, I think we're pros. <laughs> I hope that you will take many notes um, hope that you can gain uh, some new information, some good information, um, and we'll go from there. So a very warm welcome to all of you from Chicago. I want to note a couple of things before we begin type of uh, housekeeping type of tasks. We're going to be together for about 45 minutes or so today. Uh, for those of you that need to leave early or for those of you who have just come in a few minutes late, no need to worry. Once the webinar is uh, finished uh, recording and downloaded and all that jazz, we'll make sure that we get it up on our blog for you to take a look at. So our blog, news.onelicense.net, that's our web address for our blog, and you'll see that it'll be over here in this spot for our webinar. All right, so give us a day or so to get that updated. You'll also see that that's in the May newsletter that we'll have later on this week. In terms of the Q&A process for today's webinar, I do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, Shanae is going to be monitoring our Q&A for us. So if you've got your pen ready, if you aren't already familiar with our email address, it's infoau at onelicense.net. I'll spell it out for you, infoau, I-N-F-O-A-U at onelicense.net, O-N-E-L-I-C-E-N-S-E dot net. Any questions that are sent there during the webinar will receive an answer in one form or another. If the question is general and good for the good of the webinar, we'd be happy to ask the question live here. And if the question is specific about your account, it will get a specific email answer as we are able in the coming days. So again, that email address is infoau at onelicense.net. You can begin sending your questions there. Shanae is going to moderate them for us, so you'll hear her voice during the webinar, and then we'll also have a general Q&A at the very end. So thank you, Shanae, in advance for all of your help with that. You're welcome. <laughs> So we're going to get started with a website tutorial. I'm going to give you an idea of what the outside of the website looks like, and then we'll move on to the inside with the account information, downloading, reporting, and all that good stuff. So first and foremost, one license inspires congregational song. My team in Chicago, the team in Australia, and the team in Portland are all here to help you. I cannot say that enough. We ourselves are all musicians. We're folks that all work in churches and ministries and arts management and all kinds of different backgrounds that get us to be able to serve you and educate you and encourage you. We value the relationship we have with our customers, so we are here for you 110%. We appreciate those of you who had to give us a little bit of extra patience with the transition from licensing, um, especially those of you that had group licenses and diocesan licenses and things like that. So all of those things are actively being worked out. I can assure you that at one license, there's almost someone working 24 hours a day to help you. 
with your concerns. It's never been so easy to obtain copyright reprint permissions for congregational music. Now you'll notice I use the word congregation. Music for choirs, instrumentalists, cantors, accompanists, etc. is not available on our website. Even more, the permissions to do so are not available on our website. The purpose of one license is to offer copyright reprints of congregational music. So music that you would put into a worship aid, a slideshow, a bulletin, anything like that. We work with about 160 different member publishers and their divisions. That's the crux of what we do. So you'll hear me say this a couple of different times during the webinar, that if a piece of music is published by one of our publishers and they hold the copyright to it, then you're able to reprint the music through our service. The member publishers, it's up to you know, their prerogative to decide what they want to have on the website. There are some that have very robust presences, GIA, OCP, World Library, Willow, Hope, Oxford, folks like that. They're going to have downloads for you. They're going to actively manage their catalogs. Not all member publishers have the, the capability or the capacity to be able to do that. So we'll explain a little bit more as we get along, but I want to note specifically here, you can get copyright permission for the member publishers that we work with, but only some of them are going to be able to give you those downloadable high resolution music image files. All right. Really lovely video about how it works. I encourage you all to watch it here. You'll notice that you can search for music titles from the exterior of the website. So I'm not even logged in here. The reason why we do that is to have complete transparency with potential customers. So if we were to search for a song, I'm looking specifically for Marty Haugen's All Are Welcome. You'll notice that I can take a look at an intentionally blurry JPEG image but if I was to try and download anything, it would encourage me to purchase a license. So this protects the intellectual copyright and the property of Marty Haugen and GIA publications in this specific scenario. Just to give confirmation, Brenna, as you were searching a title without being logged in, can you please confirm if the same titles will show when logged in? Yes, okay. I can, yes, I can absolutely confirm that. And that's a, a great question. I know this isn't what you're asking, um, but search results might be different on different browsers. I wish I had some good explanation for this, uh, but whether you're using Safari or Chrome, Internet Explorer, or Firefox, they may uh, populate different things. It's the same way that if you were searching for something on a different website, it may populate different things. Um, so you may see that the search results are different based on your browser, but the search results will not be different whether you're logged in or logged out. Perfect, thank you. So one license works in a three-step format. We traditionally say download, create, and report. Because you, as the music director, or the secretary, or the assistant liturgy director, or whatever hat you're wearing, will typically work in this type of fashion. You would be planning the services and the music that you would need. You would be downloading the music image files that you're looking for. You would then create the worship aid, the bulletin, whatever it happens to be. And then likely you would go back at the end and report what you needed to use. Obviously, you can report when you're at the download step, and that's what I recommend. It seems to be the easiest thing to do, but you can certainly move in this download, create, and report pattern. One thing I want to note about the creation, one license itself doesn't offer any type of planning tools um, or creation services or anything like that. For every single one of you, whether you're a church or a school or another ministry organization, you're all going to use something different. So whether that's Publisher or PowerPoint or Google Docs or whatever it happens to be, everyone's going to use something different. So in terms of this create portion, we're giving you the ability uh, to download those image files um, and then be able to put them into that piece that you're creating, but the actual creation of that is not available on the website, and I hope that that makes sense. We have some select member publishers that are listed here. Again, these are the ones that are going to have very robust presences on the website, but again, we work with about 160 of them and their divisions. The news and announcement section pulls directly here from our blog. So news.onelicense.net. We publish anywhere from two to three articles each month 
on relative topics. And you'll see that those direct right here. We have a number of testimonials that are at the bottom. If you ever want to submit a testimonial to us, we'd be happy to include it. And then you'll notice our footer at the bottom of the page. There's some contact information. So for those of you looking um, for the address or for the phone number or things like that, our inf uh, info au at onelicense.net email is there. We haven't received a whole lot of calls from your side of the world, but it's there in case you need it. The FAQs, really helpful resource um, for different questions that are here. The About Us section includes the information that you would expect it to include. And then the Contact Us button. So there are a number of you that have already taken advantage of this, and I want to explain it this way. The info au at onelicense.net email address, which again is where you're sending your questions if you have them during the webinar, that is the place where you can contact our team and your ticket or your email goes into an online ticketing system. So what that means is that the email goes into one central place so that way we can answer it and assign it to the person who can answer it the most effectively. So whether you send us an email to infoau at onelicense.net or if you send a message here from the contact us link, again located here at the bottom, your email will go into this ticketing system so we can answer it appropriately. The benefit of this, and this is something that we started since I became general manager here, I wanted to be absolutely 110% sure that a single email did not go by the wayside, no one's emails got lost, and also that emails weren't being responded to multiple times. That was really important to me. You'd find that some customers may be on a, on a different service. I know that there are some services here in North America. Some things I'll get zero response on, and then some things I'll get two or three different responses on, as if these tickets are being duplicated. So that was really important to me in my value of what type of customer service and hospitality I want to provide on my website. So that was a really big part of it for us. So again, you can send an email to infoau at onelicense.net or by clicking this contact link right here at the bottom and we will get your message. Obviously, for those of you who are across the pond, it's going to be a lot easier uh, to get a hold of us via email than it is over the phone. The How It Works tab gives you a general overview of the different type of licenses that we offer. There are always new licenses, new endeavors, new projects that are being rolled out. Um, so staying up to date on this page is going to be really helpful for you. A number of tutorial videos are here. Password reset videos, searching for titles, etc. And then you can also get back to the frequently asked questions from here as well. It's important that when you're not logged into the website, so when you're just on the website for general information, that your specific country is listed in the dropdown. And the reason for that is because the information may change. There are member publishers that may have rights in your part of the world that don't in other parts of the world. So it's really important that you see how those are listed. So my parent company, GIA Publications, you'll see that we're listed here. And in Australia, you can podcast and stream the music, and you can also use the music for practice track recordings. These are those different categories that are listed here for the different copyrights that are available through the service. And that's just one example of the 160 or so that are listed here. At any time, you can click on this member publisher link, and you can see folks that have been added or removed, et cetera. The options and prices page gives you exactly what you would expect it to give. Again, you'll want to be sure that you're in the right denomination of dollars to get the accurate pricing. And then again, you'll notice that that contact link, which is the same thing that's at the bottom, is located here in the upper right hand corner. So before we move to the interior of the website, Shanae, are there any questions about the exterior? Uh, just one question that I did have someone pop up. They've noticed that in the member publisher section, you've got podcast and streaming on certain publishers and not on other publishers. Um, can you please just re-explain what the podcast streaming is, please? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so member publishers, when they become a part of our service, they sign a contract. And in that contract, it gives them the options for what additional services they want to have available. 
So to give you an example, I'll go back to GIA for a second. If you see the company name here on the website, you'll see who from GIA is included with the service. You'll see that podcasting and streaming and practice tracks are available. You'll notice that some publishers do not have podcast and practice tracks available, and that's entirely their prerogative. It's an addendum to the original reprint license. So that's why it's really important um, that when we receive these contracts that this information be updated appropriately. So a member publisher can decide to begin offering podcast streaming the same way that they can decide to take it off. Podcast streaming is an additional, um, in terms of one license world, um, it's an additional um, addendum to your license. So if you are a license holder with us, likely you have an annual reprint license. It gives you the ability to reprint music for your congregation, whether that's music, text, or words and music. But the ability to podcast, to, so to put up on your website, social media, the church website, things like that, a blog maybe, um, that's an entirely different set of permissions. And we can get into that a little bit later. And I've got one last question before we go into the internals. Um, we've got a bit of confusion with the difference between a single use license and an event license. Wonderful. So a single use license is good for a 24 hour period. And an event license is good for up to seven days. So here's how I would recommend um, you thinking about that. Um, if you're gonna use a single use license, let's say, and again, this is for folks who do not have an annual license. If you have an annual license, you're covered 110% for any events that happen at your organization, as long, here's the caveat, as it's within your average weekly attendance category, right? This is how everything is decided. So single-use licenses and event licenses are for folks that do not have annual licenses. So single-use licenses are for a 24-hour period. So if you're looking at Christmas, for example, a Christmas Eve service, a midnight mass, and a Christmas Day service would all be in the same 24-hour period. So it says single use, that does not necessarily mean a single mass or a single service. It's anything that happens within a 24-hour period. An event license is good for up to seven days in length. So usually cost effective wise, if it's anywhere from three to seven days, having an event license, so for a conference, a retreat, a workshop, a convention, things like that, is what you'd wanna have the event license for. So the single use and event license difference is all based on the time period. Perfect, thank you. Alrighty. So we're gonna head up into our login page here. You'll see that there's a password help video if you need to take a look at that. If you try to log in and it tells you that your credentials are not valid, typically that means that you just need to reset your password and you're well on your way. If it tells you that you are a billing type and you must uh, contact your account owner, what that means in our language is that billing types do not have login privileges. Billing types are really just for outgoing invoice messaging. So you'll receive the invoice um, but there isn't any type of login uh, privilege for that. And the reasoning, and I, I trust you that we belabored over this, and it's for the billing context's best interest. There's no way that we can expect a treasurer or an accounts payable person um, to be remembering their password for something that they log into once a year for something that they really don't have any use for over the year in, other than just paying their bill. So billing contacts don't want reminders about reporting usage. They don't want reminders about the newsletter, things like that. They're a different style of user. So if you get this message here that you're a billing contact, your account owner can switch that for you if it needs to be, or if you email us, we can switch it for you. Again, if it says credentials are not valid, it means that you need to reset your password. So once you're logged in, the first page that I'm gonna take you up to is the My Account page in the upper right-hand corner. So this page, um, just as of today, looks brand new. We had another website refresh that happened over the weekend. Um, there were some reporting bugs and things that were able to get fixed. Um, so this is another one of those updates that's here. So My Account, you can see my name. You can also see my dummy email address. Do not email me at this address, it will not work. <laughs> uh, so if you need to get a hold of us, it's infoau at onelicense.net. If I needed to reset my password from the inside, I could do that here as well. 
and I want to be sure that I'm subscribed to the newsletter. Under organization profile, I can see my address, I can see my denomination. Under licenses, I can see that I have an annual license and then I also have podcasting. If for whatever reason I wanted to buy a practice track license, I can do so by clicking on this green buy license button. It will have me go over my details. Don't get overwhelmed by these default worship resources. We'll be right there in just a few minutes. And then you can purchase the practice track license from there. Any invoicing actions I can do from this drop down right here. So I can view this invoice for my current account. I can also print my invoice here. So a music director or a secretary or a person who's the primary account owner, this is a great way for you to print that invoice and then give it to the person that it belongs to. Additionally, I can take a look at the terms of agreement, which is all of the fine print, really helpful information. I can also send myself a welcome packet. I wanna talk about the welcome packet for just a second. Anytime that you contact our office, we're going to send you a welcome packet. And that's because we wanna be 110% sure that you have the information that you need. Typically when we hear from our customers, it's because they have to update their contact information. Um, they have a turnover in their staff. Uh, someone is no longer there and they have to change things. So anytime that we do that, we're gonna send you a copy of that welcome packet. Uh, typically our office, um, we will copy and paste the success message that we receive into the message. So that way you can see that it did send successfully. Now I will say that checking your spam filter, just like any other email from any other website is always a good idea. We typically don't run into any issues with folks like Gmail or Yahoo or other big um, sort of email domains like that. Uh, what we do have an issue with sometimes are those smaller domains. Um, so sometimes you may have to put in an additional email. If you haven't had that experience, then you don't need to worry about it. Again, the purchase additional licenses button is here as well. In terms of default settings, these are default settings, meaning that they're not required. They're entirely optional. So you don't have to fill out anything on this page if you don't want to. If you do want to, I'll explain the benefit of it. Over here on the left-hand side, you'll see that you can choose your default worship resource. All that means is that when you're searching for files to download, the search results will display the downloaded versions from your worship resource first. Now I know that you can see all of that and you can read it, but I wanna make it very clear. If you select a worship resource, all it's going to do is populate your results to the top. It's not going to limit you to only use that hymnal. It's not going to say that you can't use another hymnal, nothing like that. All it's going to do is make your life just a little bit easier in terms of populating search results. I'll also mention here, and I'll likely mention it later, that just because these hymnals are published by member publishers does not mean that every single piece in that hymnal is available for copyright reprints. The reason is because when publishers are looking to make um, a, a robust hymnal, uh, a new product, they want to make something that's as marketable as, as possible. So it can include all kinds of one-time or independent permissions and copyrights that would not transfer over here to the one licensed service. So again, we work with member publishers. Our service is not hymnal specific, it's publisher specific. In terms of the services, uh, you can list, again, whatever number that you're comfortable with. If you are doing the vast majority of the same music at all of the same services, then you can go ahead and list the number of services that you have in a given week. The week goes from Wednesday to Tuesday, and the reason is because we want to include one entire weekend. Most churches have services on, on Saturday and on Sunday, um, so that way those can all be encased in the same weekend. The only way that this would change um, is if you were doing music at, you know, different number of, of, of services, you can easily make this number one. Um, you'll see when we get to the actual reporting page that you have the opportunity to change that in the moment. So while you may be doing the same gathering song for all three of your services in a weekend, you may have one funeral, which you'll need to have all of your songs count for one, four, as opposed to three.
So we're going to move into our report usage tab here. One thing I want to note, and this is again a feature that was launched just today, if there's a specific week that you don't have any, again, this is a dummy account, so don't be alerted by all of my red here. Um, if there's a specific week that you have nothing to report for, you have the ability to mark that you have nothing to report. Now that is not required. I don't want anyone thinking that that's required in any way, shape, or form. But what that does is allow you to remind yourself that it's not that that week is unfinished, it's just that you had nothing to report there. It also notes to our system that you're actively looking into your weeks, you're actively looking into your copyrights, and we're not gonna send you a reporting reminder message. All right, so be mindful of that. You can search for music on really any of these pages. You can search for it up here, you can search for it over here, and then you can also click on this manage button here as well, all right? So there's lots of different ways that you can report the things that you need to find. I'll note that please do not report titles that are in the public domain. So the public domain means that songs from composers that have been dead for more than 70 years, seven zero years, um, are not required to be reported because those royalties aren't going to go anywhere. So public domain pieces, Silent Night, great example. You're more than welcome to sing Silent Night as often as you'd like, and there's no need for you to report it in any way, shape, or form. However, if there is an arrangement that has been done by a living composer, that is something that needs to be reported. All right, so keep that in mind. I'll go back to our example, All Are Welcome, Marty Haugen from earlier. And now that I'm logged in, you'll be able to see that I can download any of these versions that I'm looking for. So let's break down this page a little bit here. All Are Welcome is the title. If the publisher has provided the first line, and, the, and in this scenario they have, let us build a house. The contributor is Marty Haugen. The copyright is from GIA Publications. The reason why all of these hymnals are listed here is because these are the places that the downloads are found in, okay? So if you don't use one of these hymnals, but you're looking for the download, you absolutely 110% can use it, all right? All it's noting for you is that the version you're gonna find in the Catholic Community Hymnal may be a bit different than the version you find in the Gather 3rd Edition Hymnal. All right. Now, for all are welcome, something by Marty Haugen, who's a living composer. Um, there hasn't been a lot of text updates to it or anything. You might not see any difference between all of these in terms of, of lyrics or text. Um, you will see differences in the font. So each of these publishers are going to use different font styles. You'll also notice that on this one, there's a desk camp that's available, right? So there could be different versions. There could be a bilingual version that's here, um, other sort of uh, differences like that that would make it different. You'll also notice that you can download a text file if that is of use to you. You can download a PDF. You can download a TIFF. Lots of different file formats to work in here. Again, here's again where I'll mention member publishers, it's entirely their prerogative as to what they want to have on the website. So OCP, for example, they use GIF, G-I-F, or GIF, depending on how you pronounce it. They use GIF file formats and PDF formats. Um, the vast majority of our other member publishers use TIFF and PDFs, T-I-F-F. -F. TIFFs and GIFs or GIFs. Uh, lots of <laughs> acronyms here. Um, they all serve a relatively the same purpose. Um, so TIFFs are something that um, they don't have uh, margins. So it's really great if you're working in smaller um, sorts of spaces. You also really can layer these um, behind like a projection screen. You can put images behind them, things like that. So TIFFs are going to be a little bit more malleable, uh, where PDF, which I think is the most, no matter where you live in the world, one of the most common file formats, there's nothing about this PDF that you can edit without someone noticing, all right? So there's some differences there. Um, I'll mention this, uh, this list feature and then the report feature, and then I'm sure we'll have some questions coming up. So in terms of the list feature, if all you're doing, to, if you're, all you're looking to do, excuse me, is to report this song for your list, you don't need to download it. If all you need to do is report this song for your list, you can click on this list button here. You can either select a list that you've already created or you can enter the name for a new one in. You can save and manage your list. You can save and stay on your search. 
I believe in the LSO world, this was called tags. So it's something similar. And this is a good point for me to mention that this really and truly was a merger. This was not an acquisition. And what that means is that the, the IT brains of both companies came together and said, what are the features that we want to keep? What are the features that work the most for our customers? What are the features that they have to have? And what are the best parts of each of those features? So that way we can have the best presence on the website that we are able to do. So this is one of those examples where there was a lot of collaboration that was needed in order to make that happen. So I can click on the list here. I can also click on the list depending on the download, all right? So say I did want to use a download from Catholic Community. 401 indicates the hymn number that it is in the book. I can also add that to my list as well. If I want to report the title, I click on this green button here. Now you'll notice, I'll come back to that page in just a second, um, a couple of weeks ago there were green report, and report buttons all down the side here. The format of that has changed just a little bit to make the website a little bit cleaner and easier on the eye. So in this report section here, again, you'll see the title, you'll see the composer, and you'll see that it's copyright by GIA, and then the specific resource that you're getting it from. Now, I know that you folks have graphical sources that you have to quote in order for the royalty to be given for that as well. So feel free to scroll down and find the graphical source in which you yourself are getting it from, okay? So the download might be coming from Catholic Community 401, but if you're not looking for the download, if you're just looking to report the title in general, you might be getting it from a different hymn book, all right? You select the week that you're hoping to use it on, perhaps you're reporting in the past, perhaps you're reporting in the future. This system will let you report 12 weeks in the past and six weeks into the future. So 12 past, six future. That's a really good number for you to write down as well. And again, we talked about these default services. So it's automatically going to pull up three. I have three masses that I typically have. That's my default number. If I was using this for a wedding or a quinceanera or a funeral or another one-time event, I might change that number to one in this instance. Otherwise, the default number is going to arrive there. All right? So we'll list our graphical source there. We can either submit and continue the search, or we can send and view our report. And we'll bring ourselves here to this page. And I'll go on explaining here in just a moment. I just want to see if there are any questions, Shanae. So we do have a few questions popping up right now. Um, basically, a couple of people have asked, are publishers constantly renewing and adding new files? So with All Are Welcome, you've got a specific hymnal it's coming from. Will they be updating those files in the future? Can new publishers bring in files over time and so forth? Absolutely. The answer to all of those questions is yes. Um, I, can, I can only speak um, being under the umbrella of GIA. I can give you an example. Um, so Ritual Song 2, which was our most recent hymnal, uh, just came out at the beginning of Advent of last year. So the Pew edition of the hymnal was ready to go, but the assembly files for the actual download for one license won't be ready until this summer. So I say that to give you an idea of what the publishing world looks like, just because there is a piece that's out, say you found it um, in, a, in, a, in a book that was just published, or even better, say you heard it on a CD that came out. Sometimes publishers get CDs out faster than they may get the actual engraved music out. The same is also true if you attend a, a composer's event or a concert or something like that, you might be singing along in a worship book. The download for that might not necessarily be available yet. Um, so we can talk about manual submissions in just a second because that's kind of where that, that road is leading. Perfect. And the next question is, for schools, if they report the number of times they've used the words in practice, or do they only need to report the actual services? That's a great, uh, great, great question. So I would say, um, I would see where your integrity lies. Um, if you are practicing something and you practice the first verse and then you start over and then you get eight measures in and then you have to start over, I might only count that once. You know, I would not be so legalistic um, in terms of your, your practices. Um, I would count a, a day's worth of practice as a report. I would count a dress rehearsal's worth of practice as a report. And then I would certainly um, count the actual 
you know, concert, event, worship service um, as one as well. Lovely. Now, a couple of people are wondering why the Catholic Worship Book 2 isn't there yet. Do you think it will be coming? Is this up to one license or is this up to the publisher themselves? I know you know the answer to this. It's up to the publisher. <laughs> it is up to the publisher. Um, so, and I, and I don't say that um, to pass off any type of accountability or anything like that, um, but one license only has what publishers provide to us. Um, so I know that in North America, um, we have a lot of folks that are, are requesting different Lutheran hymnals. Um, and we always say, you know, we're happy to have those hymnals there. It does. I mean, it doesn't just appear overnight. It takes a considerable amount of work from the IT team on our end. Um, but it's a, a mutual uh, agreed benefit. So the publisher agrees to do it. One license agrees to do it. And then it happens. Um, you can always contact the publisher to encourage them to have a relationship with one license where their hymnals are available. Available. And specifically, some of you will notice um, some of these hymnals you can search by number and some of them you can't. And that's kind of another layer of uh, complexity that the member publishers choose to participate in. Okay, and for the final question before we move on, what's the graphic source? The graphic source is something that's very unique um, to your part of the world in terms of the royalty having to be given for the graphical source. Um, Monica, do you want to explain more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so for Australia and New Zealand, it's the actual image that, um, that the music appears in. So for example, in a hymn book, there's certain typesetting, there's a graphic image that is, that is used. If you are photocopying that or reproducing that directly, from a hymnal, um, say for example, a lot of people have been doing that with the Aswan Voice Collections, which is just a melody line, the People's Edition, then license, one license and certainly licensing online um, provide, uh, honour the fact that in Australia and New Zealand, there is a copyright that's associated with that graphic source. So that's what we're talking about in this case. So if you're reproducing a piece of uh, music for the congregation from an edition, that is a Melody Line edition, um, you need to report that source there. Great, thank you. And I, I know, know I, been, oh, sorry. go ahead, Janine. I know I did say that was the last question, but I do have one more if we have enough time. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so um, we have someone who wants to revisit the public domain issue. They don't understand the difference between the composer and the arrangement. Sure. So the composer, um, so, so Bach or Mozart, for example, those are all folks that, that are dead. Um, there, I wish there was a lighter way of saying that. Um, <laughs> they're, they're no longer with us. Um, so their music is in the public domain. So meaning that any type of royalties are not going to go to them or to their estate or their family or things like that because they've been dead for more than 70 years. No one keeps track of how many times Happy Birthday is sung, right? In the same way uh, for Silent Night. I will give you an example. Um, the, um, the, the Gloria, the Christmas Gloria that everyone is used to singing, the name is escaping me. Um, if you are just singing the, the Gloria of that, da, 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 right? There's no um, credit that you have to give for a public domain piece. That's an example of one of those as well. The caveat to that is that Tony Alonzo, who's a GIA composer, did write an arrangement of that in the past year or so called Christmas Time Alleluia. So he wrote a piece called Christmas Time Alleluia where he uses that portion of the Gloria in his overall piece. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the difference between if you're just singing the old standard Gloria, you might only be doing public domain. If you're doing uh, Tony Alonzo's specific arrangement of it, then that is something that you're going to want to find and report. You would know. I mean, you would know if you were doing a composer's arrangement of a, of a specific song. If all of a sudden someone rewrote the words to Silent Night but used the tune, it would be important for you to give credit for that living text author. Perfect, and I think that's all we have. Okay, great. So we'll go into some search types and some reporting um, questions as well. I want, um, I want to be mindful of our time. So I'll show you here that you can search by a couple of different really helpful um, kind of browse by settings here. Um, so obviously searching by title, and, and uh, you know, I recommend searching by title and composer. So I know that all are welcome brought up the first hit here. 
Um, but if it hadn't, searching by all or welcome Haugen uh, is certainly going to make it um, the first hit there. All right. Um, also searching by the contributor. So you can, you can technically, um, you know, search for Marty Haugen this way. Uh, you can also search by the tune. Um, if you wanted to bring up a specific tune. Uh, for those of you that really enjoy um, mixing different text authors, uh, Ruth Duck is the first one that comes to mind. Um, you can find a specific tune and then match a text um, differently based off of that. All right. You can also search by meter and by psalm number. Um, meter, it, it, you know, if the publisher puts the information there, you can search for it that way. If the publisher didn't put it there, it might not be there, you know. And, and I know, again, that that might sound really um, easy to understand, but for whatever reason, um, it can be a little bit convoluted. So we only have the information that the publishers provide to us. Another example of that here, um, if I can just kind of pull one out of my head here. Um, getting rid of that. Um, so searching by the hymnal and by the number um, will bring up the resource if it is available. All right. So you'll see that this specific one, um, Richard Prue's Ubi Caritas, I may have in my possession, the gather third edition, you may have the as one voice edition, right, of a specific hymnal. All of the places where a song may be found are going to come up here on the left hand side. So whether you searched for Gather 3rd Edition 705 or Ritual Song 752, either way you're going to pull it up here. This gets a little dangerous because member publishers don't always necessarily have their hymnals linked to their songs, all right? So if I really wanted to find this song fast, I would be sure to put it up in my title field here, all right? So I hope that there's a distinction. You're going to get 99.9% .9 of your results from this search field here. This is just going to specify it a little bit um, if you use some of those larger publishing houses that we talked about earlier. I'm gonna give you an example of how to do a manual submission. So say you're looking for All Are Welcome um, written by a different composer or a different publisher. Say it's just someone else altogether. And you've done your due diligence. You know, you've searched through for a minute or two. You know, perhaps you've gone to another page. You've tried to um, delineate the search by a contributor and you just can't find it. But you know for certain that a member publisher of this song is through our service. You can be 100% sure, right? You can double check that member publishers page that would be up here if we went back to our home page, all right? If you just cannot seem to find it, then a manual submission is something that you're going to want to do, all right? We talk about this in our blog this month. This might be one of the most requested articles I've, I've ever written. So I definitely encourage those of you um, who find yourself not finding things very quickly to look through this manual submission blog post, all right? Doing a manual submission uh, is right here at the bottom of the screen. You'll see that anything that you already have populated is already going to appear here. We ask that you include as much information as you can. And then once you submit it, this goes directly to the publisher themselves to review. Now again, like what I said earlier, some publishers, very robust presences on the website, they're very active with us, and some are not. And I say that to mean, all of those publishers at least are gonna check their queue twice a year. Some of them are gonna be checking them once a week, maybe some of them several times a week, okay? So when you submit a manual submission, you're submitting it because you're trying to help the publisher. So when the website was created back in 2004, there was no way for all of these titles to be completely available. Um, just the, the amount of data that that would have taken is, is, is impossible, I guess the word would be. Um, so you might find yourself doing a a trumpet fanfare um, for your Easter service and you need to report it and something like that would not be found on one license, but you have a podcast license so you can use it, right? Like something kind of complicated and convoluted like that. Um, I know I'm talking a little fast, but the, the manual submission portion is for those of you that are having a hard time finding something that you know should be there. You will not receive a response. No one is going to respond to this message. Note here that if you want a response from us, you have to email us directly or for you folks, info AU, all right? Um, there isn't going to be any type of response back. So if it appears on your report, it appears on your report. If it doesn't, then it doesn't, all right? So in regards to that, would it, it might not appear on your report because say, for instance, the publisher's already registered that song. It's just that you weren't able to find it. 
Yeah, that's totally possible. Um, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, you didn't look through the search results enough, you know, I mean, and I know that the search can be kind of a convoluted thing, but you have to get a little, uh, you have to get a little specific with it. Easy. Another search type um, that you can look up um, in terms of the browse by settings, let me get back to my account here. Um, you can also search by mass setting. Um, so this is a really helpful one. Uh, so if the publisher has um, listed their mass here under mass setting, revised on the left, unrevised on the right hand side, um, you'll be able to see that there's um, a significant number of, of those masses there. Um, so you can pull up a mass specifically and you can take a look at those downloads. Again, if the publisher has made it available, okay, that's always going to be the caveat to our entire conversation here. Um, I know that there's another one. Um, I'll give me an example here. Let me show this whole list here. The Mass of St. Francis by Paul Taylor. I know it's one that you folks use a lot. There we go. So you'll see, for example, that this one, it has the titles listed for you to report them, but these downloads are not available yet. The publisher is working with our IT team to make those files available, all right? So here's an example of something that you'd be able to report, but you would not be able to download. So would this be a perfect example of the difference between the composer and the arrangement? So the composer, obviously is going to be ISIL because ISIL owns the text, but then your arrangement is from Paul Taylor. Sure, that would be a good way of thinking about that, yeah. And, and the reason why we have both of those delineated there is because both of them deserve a royalty. And that's kind of like the internal workings of our website for how things are listed and credited here. Um, in terms of you reporting them as the user, um, we do all of that work on the inside for you. You just report it. So there's no, you know, there's, if you're trying to report the amen on behalf of ISIL, you don't do that individually. You do that in the context of the mass that the composer wrote. Okay. So we have about four minutes or so for questions. Um, so Shanae, you can feel free to offer anything um, that you think would be valuable for our general webinar group. And again, for those of you whose questions we either didn't get to, uh, or for those of you that had too specific of questions, um, we'd be happy to follow up with those via email directly in the coming days. Okay, so let's see if we can run through these really fast. I've got a couple of people confused about renewal billing. So they're due for their bills to be renewed and they're not sure of when they should expect the renewal of their bills. Sure, so I will give you the perfect world scenario and then the what has happened scenario. Um, so at any uh, time, you folks can look at the My Account tab, look at your licenses, and then you'll see all of them listed here and you can take a look at your invoice, all right? So you'll see my, my fake date here of, of never expiring. Um, this would be for, for 365 days if it was a regular license, so don't pay too much attention to that. So typically, bills are sent out 45 days in advance. They're sent first and foremost via email. The reason why we do that is because we're an internet-based company, especially, you know, for you folks that are, that are across the ocean, email is going to be the fastest way to get it to you, all right? So 45 days in advance, about there or so, is the first time that you're going to receive a notification. After that, you will receive a paper statement if the bill has not been paid already, all right? So be mindful of that in terms of airmail and the things that, that are, are, can be expensive and, and being sent overseas. Uh, a paper copy uh, will be sent to you um, after your billing date has passed. You'll also receive reminders with an interest charge for each month. It's about 1% of your total bill, uh, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it can be irritating. I, I certainly understand that when you see that interest charge that's there. So with that, we certainly encourage you to keep your profile information up to date. You can also access um, your, uh, your users on this section too, um, and then we'll be able to, to update those users for you also. All right, that's something I wanted to mention too. So keeping those folks up to date um, and then being mindful of what your expiration date looks like here will help you never be late for your bill. And before being billed, are we able to change our average weekly attendance or does that need to be submitted as an inquiry to change before billed? 
Yeah, it can happen in either way. Typically what happens is folks receive the bill and then they notice that it needs to be updated, which is absolutely fine. Um, for those of you who are individual licenses, um, just go ahead and send us an email. We're happy to fix it for you. It's, it's very, very easy to do. The reason why we do it and we don't want you to do it is just a level of integrity. Um, we want to be sure that, that those numbers and those counts are as accurate as they can possibly be um, from that perspective. For those of you that are in group licenses and things, uh, you can email us directly because that's a, a little bit more of a specific process. Okay, and a very important question is some people are still a bit confused about what podcasting and streaming licenses are. So you folks can read a little bit more about that on the How It Works page. Um, so we have a section that's dedicated um, to what exactly the podcast and streaming license is. Um, very, 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 very specific information that's listed here. Uh, but as a, as a general uh, kind of comment, it's an addendum to your annual reprint license. Um, and it gives you the ability to put um, either, you know, podcast meaning it, it happened in the past or streaming, meaning it's live, um, up on your website or Facebook Live or um, social media or something like that. Wonderful. And we have another question. Are we able to assume that if a song was registered on licensing online, that it will be registered on one license? Great question. I would assume no. Um, there were some member publishers that were not transferred over to our service for one reason or another. The vast majority were. Really and truthfully, the vast majority were. Um, but it's entirely possible that there are some that did not. Okay. And if the publishers were transferred into one license, would we be able to assume that all of the um, details would be the same example the license number for a particular song do we have to change our slides or our pamphlets should it be the same or might it change sure great question I, and i think i heard two questions in there so a, a publisher their data may not necessarily have transferred over um, so for those of you that work primarily with smaller publishers you may find yourself doing more manual submissions than you had expected in terms of your unique license number, if you had a license with one license already, um, then you would see that, that you had a, a, a different license number. Um, the vast majority of you are gonna have um, a number start here with a number six. Um, so our service um, puts an A in front of it. So it's A referring to annual. Uh, so it's A-6 and then all of your numbers. Um, I would say that anything that you're going to reprint, you know, new going forward, please make sure that that correct information is on there. Anything that you've printed in the past, go ahead and keep using that for the life and uh, of, of that item and for the good of the environment. We certainly don't want to be printing things that we don't need, but anything that's, that's you know, coming up or future printing, uh, please make sure that correct information is there. And I will say that specific copyright line used with permission, all rights reserved, that's written in your welcome packet so please um, either request that we send you one of those or even faster you can download it yourself right here from this green tab send welcome packet okay and another question for schools mainly um, we've got multiple people wanting to report the usage on titles now I did notice you can create a user for different billing but how about multiple users to report usage yeah, absolutely. An organization can have as many users as it would like. I think part of the reason why my users tab isn't showing is because I'm on a demo account, so I apologize for that. There is a specific tab here that says users. Uh, the account owner has the ability to delete or add users, uh, billing types, sub users, things like that. You can also send us an email and we can help you out with that. And final question, similar to tags, you were able to edit your tag. Are we able to edit our list? Oh, sure. Um, so under the Manage List button in the upper right-hand corner, um, you can select the specific uh, uh, the list Excuse me, that you want to uh, edit here. Any downloads that are available, you can do that here. You can rename your list, and you can also report all of them that were selected. Note that you can't create a new list here because you have to actually find a piece of music to add it to the list as opposed to making the list first. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Brenna. You've answered all of our questions. And um, if any more come through, please feel free to send them through to info.au at onelicense.net and we'll try and get back to you as soon as possible.
Wonderful. Thank you, Shanae. And I sincerely appreciate all of your time. I know that it's the beginning of the work day for many of you. And for those of you who have worked in school environments, uh, perhaps this was a, a big sacrifice of your time. Uh, so thank you from the Windy City. I can assure you again, uh, as myself, Brenna Cronin, general manager, I have your best interest at heart. I myself am a music minister. I am here to support you, no questions asked. So thank you for taking the time to be on this webinar. Thank you so much, Brenna. I personally learned a lot from this session this morning um, and it was great to, to it'll, be, it'll be really helpful also to just remember that, um, that this is a recorded um, webinar and we'll be able to catch more of it on, um, on our website later on. So we'll, we'll look out for that. That'll be great to just revisit it. Um, Shanae and I are here to assist any of you um, with your inquiries. So feel free, as Shanae said, to send us an email if you need some help. Um, and also, um, I just want to make a mention of, the, of people who are involved in this ministry and to thank you. Thank you to the composers, thank you to the license holders, and, and a special thank you for the administrators who assist with the copyright compliance and the management. Often you're the unsung, unsung heroes. So we salute you especially and thank you also for your great work in, in, um, in this very important ministry. Thank you, everyone. It's been great to share with you this morning um, and take care and bye for now.